At the end of episode 1 of Bojack Horseman's fifth season, there is a moment where Bojack is approached at a party by the writer of the TV show Filbert, which Bojack is playing the lead role in. The writer, Flip, tells Bojack to relax and assures him of the following. I tell you, buddy, this is going to be a sensational season of television. Now those of you who have seen Bojack Horseman might be aware that the Filbert TV show within the Bojack Horseman show is actually a commentary on Bojack himself. It is about Bojack slowly losing his mind as he realizes that the fucked up reprehensible Filbert character that he is portraying is exactly like him. Filbert is a tool of the writers of Bojack Horseman to comment on how Bojack Horseman as a show has been received by the public in real life. So when the writer of Filbert says this is going to be a sensational season of television, what is really happening is that the writer of Bojack Horseman, Raphael Bob Waxberg, is saying this about his own show. And I could maybe see that as sarcasm, but it might also just be really, really cocky. Here's the thing though, Bojack Horseman is sensational television. There are a billion aspects to love about this show and in this video I want to focus on one area of Bojack's writing in particular, one that I've always found deeply impressive. The wild and creative narrative techniques that are used in various standalone episodes throughout the show's entire run. You see, while Bojack Horseman is serialized and features an ongoing storyline that works just like most normal shows, i.e. it's told in chronological order with recurring characters, A plots and B plots, flashbacks and time skips, there are occasionally episodes in which this traditional storytelling is ditched entirely. Instead, the show will, just for one episode, convey a story in a new and heavily experimental way that I personally have rarely, if ever, seen in other shows before. These episodes are entirely unique, as no narrative technique is used twice among them. However, because they are so unique, there's also no way to compare them either. So instead, here are six experimental episodes of Bojack Horseman, which I will now individually analyze the shit out of. Starting with Season 3, Episode 4, Fish Out of Water. Fish Out of Water is a very ironic name, as this entire episode is about the exact opposite, a mammal in water. Bojack, on a PR tour to promote his new movie Secretariat, is forced to visit a giant underwater city. These cities are naturally uninhabitable for any non-sea creatures, however they have their own accommodations for land dwellers who want to visit them. So Bojack is given an underwater breathing helmet filled with air that, however, makes it impossible for him to communicate with anyone around him. Now the wild thing about this episode is that aside from the beginning and the end, it does not feature any dialogue and is entirely carried by music and sound effects. As Bojack cannot communicate with his surroundings and all the native underwater people speak a foreign language, Bojack is entirely limited to gestures and actions to try and make his way to the film premiere he needs to attend. While he is underwater, he recognizes a familiar face, the film director Kelsey Jennings, who initially worked with him on Secretariat, but after they both pissed off the producer, got fired while Bojack stayed on the project. So Bojack, still feeling guilty about this, tries to walk up and talk to her in order to apologize, but a chain of unfortunate circumstances prevents him from doing so. He gets pulled into a bus that he can't get out of and dragged away into the outskirts of town with no more buses going the other way to take him back. Yes, I know this sounds a lot like that one Spongebob episode. This is what the episode is all about though, the difficulty of connecting with people. The strange and foreign surroundings that keep Bojack from reaching out to Kelsey reflect the lost connection that they once shared over trying to make Secretariat a better movie. As he is trapped in the bus, there is a pregnant seahorse that on the spot gives birth to a bunch of children that Bojack helps to deliver. The father eventually gets off and takes his offspring with him, however one of them attaches to Bojack. So Bojack, who was notoriously bad with children, has to find a way to bring this child of a complete stranger back to their parents somehow. This starts a little character arc for him. Even though he is reluctant at first, throughout their adventure he warms up to the child and forms a bond with him. 
When he reunites them with their father though, the child quickly starts playing with their siblings and forgets he's even in the room. Bojack loses sight of it among all the other children, sighs and slowly closes the door as he realizes how short-lived this one and only bond he had down here was. This realization is the true meaning of the episode. Bojack as a character has an established tendency to use half-hearted apologies to the people he wronged as a way to soothe his own guilty conscience. He usually understands when he fucks up with someone but rarely considers what the other person is actually feeling and tends to somehow make the wrongdoing about himself instead. On a subtextual level, Bojack being dragged away from Kelsey symbolizes that even though his guilt is driving him to speak to her, he doesn't even know what he actually wants to say. This is especially shown when Bojack goes through multiple versions of the letter he wants to give to her and ends up on a very stupid and shallow, sorry you got fired, that sucks for you. P.S. We're cool, right? So while he does want to reach out, he clearly does not really know how to. Just as he wants to reach out to the strange underwater people around him, but he does not know how to. This changes when he comes into contact with a seahorse child that he, if just for a short time, has to take care of. Realizing how fleeting even an unspoken bond to another person can be eventually motivates him to get back and write an actual heartfelt apology letter to give to Kelsey. Kelsey, in this terrifying world, all we have are the connections that we make. I'm sorry you got fired. I'm sorry I never called you after. So by all accounts, Bojack gets it now. His complete isolation, the silence he had to deal with, and his inability to in any way meaningfully interact with the foreign environment of this city, which the show has portrayed by omitting all dialogue from this episode, made him realize that at least when it comes to filmmaking, him and Kelsey actually had a special understanding, which is a rare thing that he should try to hold on to. Of course, this is Bojack Horseman, so he does not actually get to catch a break. When he hands the letter to Kelsey after chasing her down in a cab, the ink is all washed out and Kelsey angrily gives it back to him as she is driven off and leaves his life forever. So even when Bojack actually wants to do the right thing, circumstance turns against him anyway. Oh well. The Old Sugarman Place at the beginning of season 4 is an episode about regret. It's set after Sarah Lynn, Bojack's former TV co-star, died from an overdose while they were on a bender. Bojack flees Los Angeles and drives around aimlessly until he finally decides to visit the old summer house of his grandfather, the Old Sugarman Place. The house is abandoned and in shambles, but Bojack hides out there, trying to escape from reality while wallowing in how fucked up his life has become. During his stay there, the next door neighbor, an old dragonfly called Eddie, approaches him and after some initial arguments, they eventually bond and spend the next months rebuilding the house. What's interesting about this episode is that it contains multiple flashbacks that show Bojack's grandparents as well as his mother as a child in the 40s. They portray the family struggling with the death of their son Cracker Jack who fell in the war. Unlike normal flashbacks in most shows, however, these are not just cuts to different scenes that are obviously happening in the past. Instead, they are played out at the same time and happen within the same space as the current events that are taking place. So for example, Bojack will be huddled up in the now dilapidated house watching something on his phone as in the flashback the door in the background opens and the family enters the house looking for some of Cracker Jack's belongings. I think this way of portraying past events is a neat effect actually, because overlaying both the present and the past in the same shot gives the viewer a palpable idea of how old this place is and how much history it has seen. But it also drives home that there is a thematic connection between Bojack's behavior in the present and that of his grandparents back then. The old Sugarman couple returns to the summer house and the grandfather immediately takes off for work, leaving the grandmother alone and isolated in this place that bombards her with the memories of the son she just lost. Bojack too, after the death of Sarah Lynn, comes to the summer house and isolates himself from the outside world while at the same time actively bombarding himself with memories of what happened as he keeps watching the media reports about Sarah Lynn dying and him vanishing. This thematic connection even extends beyond the horse family. Eddie, it's revealed, has suffered the loss of his wife during an accident and was never able to let go of her. 
Eddie too then becomes part of the overlapping flashbacks that this episode utilizes. In a fantastic sequence, he and Bojack in the present, as well as Bojack's grandmother and her daughter in the past, are visiting this weird country pub or something? I, I don't know what this is, man. America is weird. Anyway, Bojack and Eddie are there to steal an old weathercock, so Eddie tries to create a diversion by playing one part of a duet on the piano. Meanwhile, in the overlapping flashback in the past, Bojack's grandmother, who's there trying to forget her grief for a moment, starts singing the second part of that same song. Again, this way of portraying the flashbacks makes it abundantly clear how similar these two characters are and how they both choose to play or sing a duet despite having lost their respective partners that they used to perform this song with. Now side note here, but the way these two scenes are layered on top of each other really makes me wonder what is actually happening in the reality of the show. Like are there actually two other people playing or singing the song with them and we just can't see them? Or are both Bojack's grandmother and Eddie so mentally broken that they are completely shutting out their surroundings and are just imagining the person who they lost playing that song with them in that moment when in reality they are both performing only one half of a duet to an increasingly uncomfortable audience that doesn't know what's going on and just feels embarrassed and God damn it, this is so depressing. Anyway, once the song is over, both characters just lose it. Eddie breaks down crying over the piano and Bojack's grandmother scarfs down an entire mug of beer and tries to kiss one of her dead son's best friends. When Bojack eventually confronts Eddie about his dead wife, Eddie tries to kill him, almost drowns himself and then when Bojack resuscitates him... <laughs> Are you insane? I don't want to live! Why did you save me? <laughs> It is through these pent up emotions that the episode reveals what it's actually trying to say. If you keep actively reminding yourself of what you lost, then you will never be able to move on. Bojack's grandmother is forced to remember by returning to the summer house where she spent so much time with her son. Eddie reminds himself by still living in the same house, not getting rid of his dead wife's clothes and by refusing to ever fly again to, in his mind, honor her memory. And Bojack, who rebuilt this old Sugarman house in order to hide away from what happened with Sarah Lynn, keeps checking the media about himself regardless. He eventually realizes though that you have to face your past in order to make the changes necessary to move on. And by rebuilding this house to hide in, he has done nothing more but erect a sad and pathetic shrine to the past that needs to be torn down. So he does, and he returns to LA. Episode 2 of Season 5, called The Dog Days Are Over, begins with Diane balling in her car and arriving at an airport with a goal to leave the country as soon as possible. To better distract and maybe find herself, she decides to travel to the country of her ancestors, Vietnam. The narrative technique of this episode is a list. Diane is forced by her boss to write a listicle about why you should visit Vietnam, a task that she is only given to fill the website she works for with a meaningless shallow content. Diane decides to make the best of it and writes down why visiting a foreign locale as a single recently divorced woman is actually a good idea and thus the episode has a framing device. Point for point, the viewer is guided through the list and with every point we get to see a corresponding scene from before or during the trip. So Diane writes that it's a good idea to visit a foreign country alone because, for example, it's good to connect with your ancient roots. She does not speak the native language though and trying to wear traditional Vietnamese clothing just makes her feel like she's wearing a costume. Ultimately, she realizes she is a tourist here, which leads her neatly to the next point, you can be a tourist here. There are more points on the list, like you can get out of your routine or you can discover a new you, where Diane pretends to be an actual Vietnamese and starts going out with an American who doesn't realize she can actually understand him, but I think you get the idea. This whole framing device leads us to a scene that initially happened in the previous episode, only this time it actually continues further than what the viewer has seen before. Mr. Peanut Butter tells Diane that even though they just got divorced, he is already seeing someone else romantically, indicating that he is moving on from their marriage quicker than Diane has. 
The extended scene still doesn't show Diane's reaction, although it is to be assumed that she is going to be shocked and upset. Another flashback then reveals that Diane already knew. This was the reason why Diane was boarding in her car at the beginning of the episode and decided to leave the country. And with a final narration, the real meaning of the list is explained. All the reasons that Diane listed in her article as to why a single woman should visit a completely foreign country were fake. She begins to understand that she was simply aimless, alone and trying to distract herself from the heartbreak of seeing her ex-husband holding someone else. The show then flashes through all the scenes of the listicle points from earlier in the episode, but now recontextualizes them and shows them with Diane standing there, isolated and sad. Thus it becomes clear that even though she made the trip to get away from these feelings, they were there the entire time. So now when we are once again at the scene where Mr. Peanut Butter confesses about his new girlfriend, which Diane already knows and which already completely broke her heart when she found out, Diane's reaction is not what was to be expected. But you survive. You learn that you can survive being alone. It is because she went to Vietnam to escape her sadness and because the listicle forced her to confront all these fake reasons of why she went that she was able to clear her mind. Yes, she felt horrible the entire time and the trip did nothing to alleviate that, but she's still here. Diane realizes that she has made it through the worst part of this divorce and she's still standing. Life will go on. And so will she. I'm really happy for you, Mr. Peanut Butter. Season 5 of episode 6, titled Free Churro, might be my favorite episode of this entire show. This episode does something that I've never seen done anywhere else. It consists of a single uninterrupted 20 minute long monologue in which Bojack gives a eulogy for his recently deceased mother. Now, technically speaking, there is one more character who talks in this episode. In a cold opening, we get a flashback in which Bojack's father picks him up from football practice and then goes into a long, selfish tirade about how difficult his life is for even having to do this. He ends on giving little Bojack the fantastic life advice that you're all alone in this world and you can't rely on anybody else and then gets angry when his son doesn't seem appreciative enough of his genius. Since Bojack's father is voiced by the same actor as Bojack himself though, I'll just count this towards the 20 minute monologue that this episode is made of. As you might expect from the episode concept, this one feels like Bojack going into an uninterrupted stream of consciousness, reflecting on the death of his mother. Bojack probably didn't prepare much for this and so he just talks, telling stories, getting sidetracked, finishing one point and starting another like a lot of people do when they ramble without a pre-planned structure. However, there are elements in this speech that are brought back up multiple times and as Bojack continues, his character goes through a small arc. Suffice it to say that Bojack hated his mother and spends half of his eulogy insulting or making fun of her. But he also tries to make sense of it all and one moment that stuck with him in particular was shortly before she died when for once she looked in his direction and despite being supposedly mentally checked out, said, I see you. Bojack spends a good chunk of the monologue in this episode coming up with different interpretations of what I see you was supposed to mean. Was it an honest, hey Bojack, I do see you, that showed she actually did care about him? In a way, he finds that idea even more annoying than if she just had hated him until the very end. Only my mother would be lousy enough to swipe me with a moment of connection on her way out. Or maybe she meant, I see you, you got everyone else fooled, but not me. The crux of the episode is that Bojack for the longest time of the monologue doesn't know what she wanted and that is his relationship with his mother in a nutshell. She was unloving and miserable and he just kind of grew up with that, mostly resenting her but also always holding out and waiting for one of those moments or gestures that made clear that she did actually love him a bit which she never got, so he is still looking for one during her eulogy. Eventually, he realizes it. I see you. I see you. Jesus Christ. We were in the intensive care unit. She was just reading a sign. 
Bojack's mother might have in fact just read a sign in the hospital room and he just now spent so many minutes trying to decipher her last words and trying to turn them into some last grand gesture that proved she did love him. He barely even cared about his dying mother and mostly we can assume he's glad that she's dead but Bojack was still holding out for closure. Till the end he was waiting for a sign that his terrible empty childhood wasn't just pointless suffering. But now he knows he will never get it. And so the show brings back what Bojack's father said to him in the beginning of the episode. That we are all alone in this world and we can't rely on anyone else. Which is made all the more true by the fact that not only did this entire episode feature Bojack as the one and only character rambling about a personal tragedy for 20 minutes, but also the fantastic ending gag that the people who are supposed to mourn with him and share his grief are not even there because he fucked up the room number. Which is a perfect encapsulation of so many aspects of his life. Oh, there's the light switch. This episode is one of the wildest in the whole show. The center of the story is the famous Halloween party that Mr. Peanut Butter throws at Bojack's house every year and has been throwing there for 25 years. The narrative device of this episode has a jump between four different years and four different relationships in Mr. Peanut Butter's life. These relationships are the story's focus. The four years that are spliced together are 1993 where he is married to Katrina, 2004 where he is married to Jessica Biel, 2009 where he just got together with Diane and now 2018 with his new fling Pickles. The jumping between years in this episode is extremely abrupt. There is no special transition whenever it happens. Often it will cut from a scene in one year to a scene in another year as if it was in response to the previous one making everything seem like one continuous experience. This is very much the point. The viewer is simply supposed to follow every timeline and keep the four different years apart and the show thankfully provides a few ways to keep track of which year we are in despite there being no transitional effects. First, as this is a Halloween party, are the various costumes, outfits and hairstyles. Bojack, for example, is wearing a horse in a round shirt in the 90s as well as the typical 90s hairdo that we've already seen him with in multiple flashbacks. In 2004, he's only wearing a bathrobe, in 2009, he's wearing his standard outfit and in 2018, he's wearing the filbert detective suit from his current show. Characters will also often as a joke reference whatever year it is in the scene in a way that completely breaks the fourth wall. This is actually a pretty great running gag that even outside of this episode is used to establish the time frame of a flashback in a comedic way. Generic 90s grunge song for everyone in Flanders. Generic 90s grunge song something from Seattle. Probably the most important indicator of the current time, however, are the four partners of Mr. Peanut Butter. The reason why the episode abruptly cuts back and forth between the four different years is to make the viewer aware of how Mr. Peanut Butter treats his partners when he is around other people and how every year it eventually leads to a massive fight. All years start roughly the same. Mr. Peanut Butter and his wives put on their costumes and leave for the party. As they arrive and the party runs its course, it becomes clear that all of his partners are not fully comfortable being there, which they try to communicate to him. Katrina doesn't know anybody there and doesn't want to be left alone. Jessica is scared of running into a specific Halloween costume. Diane is extremely socially conscious but wants to prove that she's fun at parties. And Pickles is worried about being only an insignificant fling after he just got divorced. Mr. Peanut Butter, however, being the excitable and popular dope that he is, does not listen to any of them and constantly gets sidetracked by his other acquaintances. This always eventually leads to some kind of disaster which all of his partners blame on him. Probably rightfully so. I find the narrative device in this episode extremely clever for multiple reasons. Since Mr. Peanut Butter and his partners usually make up at the end of the night, none of these disasters are actually the end of any of these relationships. We as the viewers, however, have seen most of these women as characters in the show in previous episodes and know for a fact that all of them eventually divorce him. It is exasperating to see Mr. Peanut Butter falling into the same pitfalls again and again regardless of who he is together with which it is supposed to be. 
While he is great at finding and getting involved with women, as he is a lot of fun to be around, this makes it clear that he is terrible at actually keeping a long-term relationship. He has trouble focusing his attention and he often fails to consider the perspective of his significant others. Because the episode shows the four different years in almost a seamless comparison of the same event, it also becomes clear that a lot of the other characters who are at this party are developing. Princess Carolyn, for example, starts out as an assistant working on Bojack's show in the 90s portion and spends her first years at the party getting stuck on door duty. Which she does without complaining because she's still sucking up to her superiors in hopes of a promotion. Over the years, however, as she takes responsibility for her own success, we then see her free herself of that role and delegate it to others, just as she eventually takes the leap and starts her own agency. Diane, as the shy introverted nerd that she was, also spends her first year being too afraid to talk to people and when she eventually does, she embarrasses herself and wants to leave. The viewer, however, has at this point spent five seasons with Diane as one of the main characters and knows that she has grown and gotten used to being around famous people. So in the current year, where Mr. Peanut Butter is with Pickles, she spends most of the party being annoyed and trying to leave and finding the people that boxed in her car. It is obvious that she does no longer believe that these celebrities are somehow better than her and she has no trouble talking to anyone. Not to mention that at the end of the episode she is the one who gives moral support to Mr. Peanut Butter and his new girlfriend who, as it always happens at the Halloween party, got into a massive fight. So Princess Carolyn and Diane have grown and matured tremendously, while Mr. Peanut Butter still repeats the same mistakes again and again. And it is through the disjointed and experimental four timelines of this episode that this becomes ever so clear. Season 5, episode 11, titled The Showstopper, is basically the climax of season 5 and in many ways the lowest point of Bojack as a character. I mentioned in the beginning that in season 5, Bojack is playing the lead in a show called Filbert and that Filbert has many parallels to Bojack himself. It's essentially a tool for the writers to comment on their own show within their own show. In the showstopper, this framing device catches up to the Bojack character as he becomes so paranoid that he starts to lose grip on his identity and it becomes almost impossible for him to distinguish between the events of Filbert and his real life. Where in the Halloween and the old Sugarman Place episodes the show abruptly cut between various different years, here it abruptly cuts between two different realities that bleed together more and more as Bojack loses his mind. Early on in the episode, Bojack, who is permanently high due to overdosing on painkillers by the way, gets it into his head that the Filbert Show scripts are now stealing ideas from his own life. He also receives a mysterious anonymous ransom note that threatens to expose all of his secrets. Bojack is suspicious of everyone around him, the show writer, the manager, the other actors and so on. His suspicions only grow when he starts to interrogate them about this and they all behave weirdly for some reason. Unlike Bojack, the viewer however knows that this is because of other secrets all these side characters have and none of them actually involve him. But Bojack of course takes this behavior and spirals out of control with paranoia. At this point he has done so many awful things that he's just waiting for one of them to come to light and so more and more he believes that someone on the show intends to ruin his life. As I already mentioned, that storyline happens to be mirrored in the current script that the Filbert show is filming as well. Filbert is hallucinating that his supposedly dead ex-partner Fritz, who also killed his wife, is back and now there is a mysterious person about murdering other people from Filbert's past, so he and his partner Celsi Malone are chasing them. Just as Bojack is gathering evidence to figure out who is trying to sabotage his life, Filbert is doing the same in trying to figure out the identity of the killer. Scenes of Filbert and Bojack intercut constantly in this episode and the effect is achieved with a thousand little misdirects of the viewer. The fact that even outside of his filming schedule Bojack keeps wearing Filbert's detective uniform makes it more and more difficult to distinguish the two realities for example. 
Bojack is also dating Gina, the actress that plays Filbert's girlfriend and partner Celsie Malone, so they keep being around one another, talking in bed and so on, both within and outside of the show. Not to mention that the show set for Filbert's home looks exactly like Bojack's house, a previously unimportant detail that had been set up as a joke in a previous episode. Let's analyze one sequence in particular here. In this scene, you see Filbert and Sassy looking at an evidence board, going through all the available info to advance the investigation. In the next shot, a subtle switch takes place, and you get a close-up of the same evidence board, except now a bunch of pictures of Bojack's acquaintances are on there. As the shot zooms out again, Bojack is no longer talking to Sassy about the TV show murder, but instead to his personal assistant about the mystery person trying to ruin him in real life. He then asks her about the time and, thinking that he is at home, tells her, oh shit, I need to get back to set, only for her to remind him that he already is on set. A couple scenes later, Bojack once more is at the evidence board trying to piece together clues. He connects some more markers, narrates an important revelation he came to and once more it is revealed that his assistant is standing there taking notes for him. He then dramatically poses into the camera as if he is filming a cut to commercial and waiting for someone to yell cut, only for the assistant to be confused and point out that he is at home right now and she came to get him because he didn't show up for work. So instead of him mistaking the set for his house, now the scene has been reversed and he mistook his house for the set. Either way, he completely lost himself in these investigations. It is exactly this type of scene transitioning and cutting that makes this episode so great. It works well thematically because both Bojack and the Filbert character are working towards a similar goal, i.e. trying to solve a mystery with dire consequences for themselves. Which means Bojack can't escape the paranoia neither in his professional nor in his personal life. Now Filbert, just like Bojack, is hiding a huge secret that he doesn't want anyone to know and that he doesn't even really know himself. Here we get to the actual twist of the episode. Both characters are the culprits of their own demise. Filbert's secret in the TV show is that it was not his dead partner Fritz who killed his wife. Fritz never existed. Instead, Filbert did it himself. His subconscious merely convinced him it wasn't so. Bojack in his real life, meanwhile, gets confronted with the fact that the ransom note someone sent to him is only a marketing ad from the Filbert show. And what's more, within the show, Filbert unknowingly sent it to himself. Meaning that the actual Bojack in his guilty drug adult mind might have unwittingly copied this plotline from his own show and tried to sabotage himself into revealing his own worst secrets. However, when confronted with this fact by Sassy in the show as well as Gina in real life, both Filbert and Bojack do not take it well. And so we come to an incredibly harrowing scene that is the ultimate payoff of the cutting back and forth between TV show and reality. As the argument escalates between them, the viewer sees Filbert beginning to strangle Sassy because she found out about his wife's murder. The next shot then reveals that we are actually watching the scene from the perspective of the film crew as they are shooting it. The director then yells cut, except Bojack doesn't stop. He is now so lost in the Filbert character that he actually tries to strangle Gina and the people around him have to intervene and get him off her. What the fuck is wrong with you? The episode then ends with Bojack finally ascending a flight of stairs that have been teased multiple times throughout. As he reaches the top, he stares into the giant looming Filbert balloon that got cut loose at the premiere of the show and he realizes that he now has become the terrible, immoral kind of person that the Filbert character always represented to him. So there we go. These were my favorite examples of all the wild and unique narrative techniques that Bojack Horseman used throughout its entire runtime. There are quite a few more equally creative examples that I didn't even go over to keep this script manageable. There's an episode in which a pair of rival side characters keeps insisting on the viewer that they are the main characters of the story. There's an episode in which Bojack basically ends up having a therapy session with a newspaper customer service rep and of course there's the famous penultimate episode, The View from Halfway Down, which I don't even want to spoil at all. All of these episodes have their own unique twists on how you can tell a story in 20 minutes. Not only are these narrative techniques 
super entertaining and lend a chaotic energy to the show that keeps it fresh, they also always accentuate or work towards a point that the respective episode is trying to make and I love that this show is willing to experiment so frequently on that kind of level. So yeah, thank you for listening and watch Bojack Horseman. Boken, signing out.